Now let's welcome any guests we have. Chris, you can identify yourself. Mike Hollis, PNC. Good to see you, Mike. Good morning. Hey, Rick. And okay, then let's go around the table, Paul. Paul Dumars, Finance Committee. Bill McDaniel, Finance Committee. Bill, we're up to you. Oh, sorry, Bill Moore. Sorry, Finance Committee. Everybody knows Bill. Excuse I'm not me, sure. I'm sorry. Bill, you don't need an I'm introduction, just, actually. Is he studying then? <laughs> Those short naps thing. help at his age. Oh, he's just reading our agenda. Um, Rick Miller, Finance Committee. Leanne Evans, School District Treasurer. Uh, Blair, I guess. Or, no, sorry. Heather. Heather Frederick, I'm the Chief Financial Officer. And Blair Littlejohn from the Office of General Counsel. And then who do we have online? We've got a long list online. Um, I was looking, what I'm going to, going to do, we can run through the names, but I was looking for the committee members and I don't see committee members online yet. So what I'm going to do is, um, there are several people that have logged in with phone numbers. So those of you that are on the phone, if you could send me an email after the meeting, then I'll know you attended and I can add you into the minutes as attending. Um, we've got Scott Sweeten and Steve Alexander from PFM on the phone. And then we have, let's see, TJ Whitehouse is there, Tom Kai, Robbie Cox, um, I think it's Gary Gray, even though it says Rebecca Gray, Mike Baldwin is there, um, Laura Howe from PFM, Laretha McIntyre from my office, um, John Generale, Barbara McQuinn, our board member is here, Anna is here from City, and then we have a whole bunch of people on the phone. So everyone on the phone, again, if you just send me an email after the meeting to let me know that you attended, then I can add you into the minutes. Okay, that's a good large group, a lot of yes. interest. Well, it's great that we can offer the virtual. So many people can attend online, and if they're busy, the, the meeting is available afterwards on YouTube. So everyone can see the meeting um, and it's very helpful for committee members mm -hmm. if you're not able to physically get here one day you can log in and do it remotely mm -hmm. okay that's good um, first item is approval of the agenda is there any comment uh, so moved okay second moved and second any dissent to that agenda is approved approval minutes of may 20. is there a are there any comments on the minutes of May 20, which are attached, very short? Any comment? None here. Okay, without objection, we'll, we'll approve that. Um, public comments. Anybody interested in talking about the financial circumstances? Mr. Koner just joined our committee, one of our committee oh, members. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Koner. How are you today? Is he on? I can see him. Where, can so you we, see him? Can he's at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen up there. Hello. And Jack Warner may be joining oh, Jack. us. All right. Is Jack on the line? Not yet. We haven't seen him pop in, but he was trying to attend virtually today. Michael Coner is on the oh, oh, I'm here sorry. in the corner. Excuse me. Michael, we're talking about you. Michael, how are you? <laughs> okay. Um, items for approval, and this is, we know it's a short item here, quarterly investment reports. Right, we, we really only have two things on the agenda today. Um, it is the quarterly investment reports, and I'm going to give you an overview of the capital budget. Um, and the only other thing, and let me just click this button to make this go away. Um, the only other thing I wanna point out at the back of the, the bottom of the agenda, I guess on the second page, if you have it in person, um, I have the next meeting listed as September 20th, and I'm recommending that we cancel that meeting. We usually have that meeting in when we're doing a TAN sale, and we will not be doing a TAN this year. Once again, we have plenty of cash and don't need to do that short-term borrowing. So unless something comes up, and I can't imagine what that would by, might be, we'll be canceling that meeting, and our next meeting would be on October 28th. September, September 20th. Nope, well, it'll be October 28th. We'll skip the we're September We're going to skip meeting. the September 20 meeting. Okay, no tan sale. We can talk about that, I guess, in so, a few um, minutes. Is the next meeting October, you say? Yes. It's October. It's October 28th. October 28th. Oh. On the, the back side of the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you should have them in your calendar. I sent yeah. them out um, at the beginning yeah. of the year. 
no, and I'll probably go ahead and start check. sending out the meeting, future meeting dates for, F, for calendar year 23 so that you can start getting them on your calendar. Okay. Okay, so we're going to start off with the quarterly investment reports, and as we always do, we're going to open it up to PFM to give us a market update. I'm not sure if Steve Alexander or Scott Sweeten will be doing that, so who's, who drew well, the short straw today? <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. This is Steve Alexander. Uh, Scott Sweeten will do the market update, but just want to give out a personal announcement. I've, uh, I'm going to be retiring this December 23rd. After 26 years at PFM, and uh, it's been a great joy working with all of you at Palm Beach, and we did so much. Uh, I'm hoping to attend the, the last Christmas uh, party in December with you all, but I want to let you all know that I've announced it and it's public, and uh, want to uh, get that information to you today. And thank you so much for all your support over the years. And uh, Scott Sweden and Richard Pengelly will be uh, working with uh, you and Leanne to, to carry the flag forward. Steve, thank you for your great service. You've, you've been terrific for us. Thank you. And I know you've done a, we know you've done a great job and I'm glad to see like following in David Moore's footsteps. Yeah. You're not retiring until the Christmas party. <laughs> That's right. And we'll then celebrate you in a real, with real we'll spirit. We'll miss you a lot. Thank That's you, sir. Sure. Thank you. Very one lucid of the, comments. One Definitely. of the things we've asked, I've asked Steve to do before he sails off is to arrange for the folks that um, do the market update for the Florida Palm Investment Pool. As you know, I'm on the advisory committee for that pool. And they do a market update that's a little different. It's really geared towards the pool. It talks about stress testing the pool and all the components that go in it. And I've asked them to manage to do that, either the October or the December meeting. And I, I've right. said it many times, every time I see that, and Mrs. McQuinn's on the phone, on the call, and she gets to see those, meet those updates. And it's a little different than what we normally get, and I think all of you would really enjoy it. So I'm not sure Steve's working with the group to see when they're available. So either October or yeah. December. So this is a stress test of our assets and our um, investments. It, it's for the invet, for the local government investment pool. Mm -hmm. So we see oh, that on a regular I mean that basis. we would do it for, for this. They they have they can do a stress test on our and our we pool have as well. done it before. Yep, they can do our they can do ours. And if we okay. if we like that, it's something you all want to see. We can ask for them to do that on a regular basis. Well, why don't you show us? Don't you think that would be a good idea? And we'll see. If yeah, it... we'll show we'll show you what it looks like for the pool, and you'll get a flavor for it. And I think you'll really enjoy that. It's a little it's different. It's one of the best market updates I've ever seen. <clears throat> seeing it from a pool perspective. Okay. Yeah, the market update we, the market update we do for the Florida Palm Pool is more in line with a two A seven regulated uh, money market fund. So it it really adheres to all the requirements that the SEC has for a money market fund. So the, the market update and the various accounting and stress testing that we do on a regular basis really uh, rises to that next level uh, consistent with the SEC rules. That's a short-term, purely short-term investment mm -hmm. pool then. Yes, it is, yes. Whereas we have a little bit of range. We have something a little longer. Mm -hmm. And that yes. would apply also or could work for us as well? Well, we. In the past, we have done the stress testing of the of the long term portfolio for the school district, and we certainly can do that again. But we we we've done that before, uh, typically, and in this type of uh, environment when rates are rising. Mm -hmm. Good idea. All right, I'll have Scott Sweden take you through the market update. And Scott, just tell me what slide you want me to start on. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Scott Sweden with PFM Asset Management. Uh, I will add to Steve's comment. I tried my hardest to talk him out of retirement, but he has a crazy idea that he wants to enjoy his life. So uh, we're all sorry to see him go. Thank you, Scott. We can start on slide four. four thank you, Leanne. Okay, uh, I think the I'm there. Market, yes. And can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. The, the market themes that we're looking at, uh, they're still very relevant today as they were for the last two or three quarters. Uh, just starting with the three bullet points, the U.S. economy is characterized by, uh, we're, we're all very well aware of the environment that we're in, uh, record persistent inflationary pressure uh, across the board. Uh, regardless of what indicator you're looking at, we're pretty much uh, looking at year-over-year -year increases of 
significant amounts where we have not seen those in the last 41 years. A uh, strong labor market, actually at 8.30 this morning, we will get the July job data, so that'll give us a, a much clearer picture on where we stand on that front. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, we are at full employment, so the Fed is purely focused on trying to tame the inflationary pressure. Uh, at the Federal Reserve level, I'll get into a little bit more detail when we get to the dot plot, but obviously the Fed has been very aggressive as of late, just in the second quarter, they raised rates 150 basis points. I think we're, we're all aware of the inverse relationship with fixed income securities and their market value when rates are increasing. So just setting the stage there. Uh, obviously, balance sheet reduction is a big part of the focus going forward as well. Um, looking at the market in general, I'll touch on that in, in more detail as we move through the slides, but ultimately <clears throat> one area that's continuing, the Russia-Ukraine war, it's gone into the fifth month now. Um, that's affected commodity prices. Uh, Ukraine is essentially the uh, agricultural breadbasket for Europe, rising labor costs. And uh, interesting statistic this morning, uh, with uh, Ukraine, they actually supply roughly 90% uh, of semiconductor grade neon gas, which is used in the production of semiconductor chips. So uh, we have already talked about this for the last two or three quarters at least, that there is a significant supply chain bottleneck in that particular category. And I was reading this morning that this is actually the sixth month in the row that semiconductor demand has declined. So that's also indicative that global demand is slowing. Uh, economies across the world are slowing as well. And we can move to the next slide, Lena. Now I'll, I'll provide an update here. This uh, the consumer price index, you can see how it is significantly steepened and increased since March of 2020. And that's pretty much right when we uh, were diving into the, the peak of the pandemic. Uh, but the reading that you see there at 8.6%, that was actually the May number. The most recent reading will be the, the June number, and that came in at 9.1%. So we still are continuing to see at least the consumer price index continues to heat up and set record levels. Uh, you can see the shaded bar portion that's indicating the components that comprise that number. Uh, the next reading for that will be August 10th, so that'll give us a pretty good idea. So uh, in a timely fashion, we have uh, the job numbers coming out momentarily, and then we'll also have the CPI number in roughly five days. So that'll give us a pretty good indication of what we're going to expect going forward. And we can move to the next slide, Dan. When you do that slide, the different colors, so for instance, energies in green, is that the whole way up from bottom to top, including the different colors when you get to the top? Of Correct. And for instance, if you look back in 2020, uh, most geographic areas were shut down or restricted travel. So that I think that would make tremendous sense that energy would be flat or negative because really no one was traveling at that point. Yeah. But as the economy reopens, you can start to see that significantly change. So it's energy that's on top in terms of inflation. Correct. And I, I think we're, we're all aware every time we go to fill up our car or truck or any vehicle, uh, and certainly at the grocery store, we, we notice that significant impact there uh, almost daily. Um, is that what is affecting the consumer confidence? Because you didn't make a comment when you went through that. Right. It, the inflationary pressure, because that's hitting everyone essentially in the, their wallet, their pocketbook, their purse. So we're all very uh, sensitive to that currently. Uh, there's also an argument that we are in a recession or we're headed into a recession. So 
a lot of that is actually contributing to the decline in consumer confidence. And I'll touch on that in a, I believe we have a future slide on that. Okay. So, and we can move, we can skip this one, Leanne. <clears throat> now, this is a, a pretty good slide, which uh, gives a pretty good picture of if you're looking in the rear view mirror and also if you're looking through your windshield. If we look at the upper left quadrant, tailwinds, U.S. unemployment rate, you can see that there was a dramatic improvement in the unemployment rate, the most recent reading uh, until a few minutes from now. The, the June unemployment rate was at 3.6%, uh, almost back to pre-pandemic levels. February of 2020, uh, we were actually at three and a half percent. Now, looking at the upper right quadrant, this shows, and speaking to your question, sir, the uh, consumer sentiment significantly dropping off, and we've already kind of discussed that a bit. Uh, retail sales, you have noticed a, a steady increase there across the board. And in the bottom right quadrant, uh, this makes perfect sense in the environment that we're in. Uh, as the Fed continues to raise rates, mortgage rates are also so increasing, so existing home sales are uh, declining rather significantly. And we can move to the next slide. Now, this really gets us into the, the first part of, uh, are we in a recession or do we expect to go into a recession? So by definition, one of the definitions, a recession would be two consecutive negative quarters for GDP. Now, now, in the first quarter of 2020, you can see that we were at a negative 1.6. The first estimate for the second quarter is, is actually at a negative 0.9%. Now, if we wanna be optimistic, there are two other estimates that'll come in for the second quarter. So potentially it may end up flat, it may end up positive, but realistically we'll probably still be in uh, a slight negative category. If you look to the right portion of the slide, you can see the Bloomberg Economist forecasts of uh, the probability of going into a recession at 33%. Uh, they actually released this morning, their new model is predicting a, a recession by 2024 and the probability is 100%. So that's a pretty significant change there. We can move to the next slide. Thank you. And these are basically a recap of some very important data. Certainly the, the Fed monitors and uh, we, we all monitor as well, but uh, looking at GDP, uh, again, you can see the projections, March, June. Uh, I've, I've already given you the most recent data there. But pretty much you can see that will is being forecasted to stay in a pretty tight range moving forward. Uh, in the upper right quadrant, the unemployment rate, again, a lot of these may change based on data coming out this morning. But for the most part, that stays in a, a fairly tight range as well. Uh, the bottom left quadrant, that would be core personal consumption expenditure. That's the main indicator that the Fed monitors for inflationary pressure. And the most recent reading there, the core PCE for June was at 4.7. So well above the 2% inflation uh, target that the Fed has historically monitored. So you can see the projections for 2022, and then it starts to ladder off where we get back in a uh, level that historically we've become accustomed to. Uh, Fed funds rate, you, you can see the projections here. Uh, I did hear a few of the Fed governors yesterday uh, speak out publicly that they believe the Fed funds rate will actually be in excess of 4% by the end of the year. So we can move to the next slide, Leanne. Now, I, I think this is a very telling story of the, the environment that we're all dealing with. Uh, if we just take a look at the right portion of the slide, you can see the light blue dotted line. That was the end of 2021. 
the light blue line above that, that is the end of the first quarter of 2022. And the dark blue line at the top, that is as of the end of the second quarter of this year. So a quick visual takeaway, you can see just a dramatic steepening in the yield curve, certainly from that one to three year time frame. Uh, currently, we're also looking at an inversion in the yield curve, which again, historically has been an indicator of an upcoming recession. Uh, the two year is yielding more than the 10 year, which uh, the, most recently uh, the two year was around a 3.06 and the 10 year is around a 2.68. So that's a pretty significant uh, inversion in the yield curve. So just, you know, there's two components that are indicating the probability of a recession. And if we take a look at the matrix on the left portion of the screen, you can see the significant change in yield from the first quarter to the second quarter. Uh, ones that would be relevant to your portfolio, you can see the one year uh, indice that was up 1.14% uh, just quarter to quarter. The two year was up 62 basis points and the three year was up 50 basis points. So some pretty significant moves. And we can move to the next slide. Now, this is the most recent Fed dot plot, and this shows where the uh, Federal Reserve members are projecting interest rates. So you can see in 2022, that's a, a pretty tight grouping, not a lot of deviation among the members. And we're all aware of the Fed strategy right now. They've already raised 150 basis points just in the second quarter. Uh, we do anticipate a 50 basis point hike in September. Uh, the caveat is uh, Chairman Powell has come out publicly and stated that uh, it's everything is going to be data driven. So it's going to be a very fluid process as we move forward. But if you start to look out in 2023, 2024, you start to see a much wider dispersion among Fed members and where they anticipate interest rates to be at. Uh, even longer term, you start to see a, a steep decline as far as the projections there. And we can move to slide 13, Leon. Let me ask you, does it seem to, at least seems to me along with the other indicators here that the Fed is driving us toward recession to some degree or has been with these interest rate hikes? I would tend to agree with that personally. I think, I think you know, you've, you've heard a lot of criticism that they have been uh, far behind the curve in battling inflation. And certainly the numbers, well, the July payrolls just came out. That was, well, came in at 528,000 jobs, which the estimate was for around 250. So that's a pretty strong number there. Uh, this particular slide is essentially showing the one to three year indice and uh, four different sectors within the fixed income space. And really what we're looking for here, this is more indicative of where we're finding value in the current market. And for instance, if you take a look at federal agency yield spreads over treasuries, the black line is indicating where treasuries would be at essentially. But so really there's not a significant, albeit even minimal uh, difference in yield spread there. So that currently is not a value play for us. On um, the opposite end of the spectrum in the upper right quadrant, you're looking at corporate notes, A to AAA. You notice a dramatic yield spread differential there. And I'll actually give, give specifics on some of the yields that we're currently picking up in this market. So. Uh, the bottom right quadrant, that's another area that we're finding value, and you will see those in the portfolio, but asset-backed securities. And the bottom left quadrant, again, mortgage-backed securities, that's also currently tightened up dramatically and uh, really not a value play in the current space. Uh, let me ask you also on this question of sure. value. Is the value um, going up? because the security is being lessened? I mean, in effect, they're, they're more risky? 
One more time, sir. Is the, I apologize. Are the values going up because, the, because of the security backing those obligations is a lesser security because it has greater risk? For the most part, uh, the corporates, the yield spreads have gone up because the, there have been many more issuers coming to the marketplace. Certainly, uh, they're able to offer much more attractive yields. So that's typically why you're seeing that significant spread. Uh, sometimes you do see a large differential also if they were uh, more risk for the reward, for the potential reward. But, you know, that would be much more indicative if we were looking at a lower rated corporate like Triple D's, for instance, you would probably see a significant uh, imbalance there. But for the most part, uh, that, that would... So you're getting a your better return on a um, quality investment, is what you're saying? Correct. Okay. And we can move to the next slide. Now, this, this really tells the entire story. It did in the first quarter of this year, and it certainly does in the second quarter. Uh, really, in the fixed income space, there was no place to hide. Uh, looking at the one to three year indice, just in the second quarter, if we look at the various sectors within the fixed income space, treasuries, agencies, asset backed securities, corporates A to triple A and triple B corporates, negative returns across the board. Most of that can be attributed to uh, a very active Fed. And on the right portion of the screen, from an investment advisor standpoint, we like to look at things much longer term. And you can see over a 10 year average, the complete opposite uh, for each of those categories, you're looking at positive returns across the board. So uh, I think as we all know, the market goes through cycles. We're going through some volatile and very fluid cycles currently. Uh, but I do think, uh, again, in the long run, things always play out, even looking at the equity markets as well. And we can move to the next slide. Actually, we can go right to, what slide are we on right now? Can't see the bottom, 16. <clears throat> you can keep going, Leanne, I'll, I'll tell you when to stop, sorry. Here we, here we go. Part of this is cut off, but. Now this is a consolidated summary of the accounts. Can you move that down a little bit, Leanne? Thank you. I'm sorry. Go back. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the PFM managed account, the total assets as of June 30th were $554,074,946. If we look at the right quadrant, that's the sector allocation. So commercial paper, uh, pretty significant certainly in the short-term account. And then you have treasuries, corporates, agencies, and municipals. Taking a look at the maturity distribution on the bottom portion of the slide, uh, you can see the very healthy portion is under that 180 days uh, or less. So, you know, that's one area that uh, Leanne has certainly been very active in and picking up attractive yields in that area. So uh, we can move to the next slide. Now this gives a, a good breakdown uh, essentially bet between the core portfolio, which would be on top, and the short-term portfolio as well. Uh, the one area that I'll, I'll focus on here, if we take a look at the core portfolio, yield on cost, 0.84%. So essentially what that indicates is on June 30th, the portfolio was yielding 84 basis points. Now, if we look at yield at market, which is significantly higher <coughs> at a 295, that would be indicative of on June 30th, if we were actually putting new money to work or reinvesting assets for you, that would be the level that we would have been reinvesting at as of June 30th. And then if we take a look at the short-term account, you can also see a pretty significant difference there between yield on cost and yield at market. And we can continue. Thank you, Ann. 
Now the next two slides are more pertinent from a compliance standpoint. And this is the sector allocation analytics. The gray portion of the bar is indicating the maximum levels permitted by your investment policy. The blue shaded region is where you were actually allocated at the end of the second quarter. And just a quick takeaway, we've got a very healthy buffer between where you're allocated and, and the maximum limits of your policy. So ultimately that puts us in a great position as the investment advisor uh, allows us to be very flexible, nimble, and when opportunities do arise in the marketplace, we're able to take advantage of that very quickly. And we can move to the next slide. Now, again, from a compliance standpoint, the max maturity analytics, again, the gray portion of the bar is indicating the max maturity for each of these sectors. And the blue shaded region is where you were allocated at the end of the second quarter. So again, from a compliance standpoint, you're in great shape uh, with those two. And we can continue on, man. Now, uh, to me, this is a great, essentially a bird's eye view of the uh, account summary. It shows the issuer diversification. And, and you can see the sector breakdown on the left the percentage that it comprises of the overall market value. And then you see three ratings from Standard & Poor, Moody's and & Fitch. And you can also, as you look through certain issuers, uh, you can see split ratings between the credit rating agencies. A lot of that can be attributed to changes in their rating methodologies, which they, a few of them did during COVID. Uh, I have not noticed any uh, recently. So uh, the one thing I'll point out, when we were going through COVID, uh, there were quite a few corporate downgrades and I will send out an email to Leanne when that does take place. But uh, the one thing I'll point out is if you look at the corporates and you just look at the percentage of the overall market value, you can see minimal exposure to each individual issuer. So that is, how we do manage risk to a, a certain extent as well. And we can continue, Leanne. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, this is just a snapshot of the core portfolio, a total market value as of June 30th, 107 million, 226 dollars and 17 cents. Uh, the one thing I'll focus on, on there as well, portfolio effective duration, 1.52 years. The benchmark effective duration is 1.78. So we are uh, significantly uh, lower as far as a duration standpoint than the benchmark. So uh, that really puts us in a, a sweet spot right now for finding value. And we've already reviewed yield at cost, yield at market, the Portfolio credit quality is double A. <clears throat> and taking a look at the upper right quadrant, you can see the allocation among treasuries, corporates, agencies, and municipals. The bottom right is just reflective of the duration distribution. And the bottom left quadrant is showing ratings purely from Standard and Poor. And we can move to the next slide, Leanne. Can actually continue forward. Next slide, please. This, this looks like the slide I create regularly. <laughs> I have more colors on mine, but it looks very similar. Yeah, these are visually confusing sometimes, but uh, if we can move to slide 28, Leanne. Thank you. Now, this shows the portfolio activity just in the second quarter. On the left side, we're, this is reflected with a bar chart. So you can see that we were purchasing corporates and the gray portion of the bar would be indicating sales or maturities. So you can see that there were sales or maturities in the agency space. You know, as I alluded to earlier, that currently is not a value play for us. And taking a look at the right side, that just breaks it out in a numerical fashion. And we can move to the next slide. Now, 
One area that I, I never, well, I don't think any of us are happy with uh, the environment, but, but you know, we're, we're navigating it to the best of our ability. Just in the second quarter, the portfolio had a negative 51 basis point return. The benchmark was at a negative 50 basis points. And your benchmark is the ICE <coughs> Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, one to three year US Treasury index. And just to put that in perspective, just in the first quarter, that index had the worst performance since 1970. And again, in the second quarter, uh, a very uh, challenging quarter to say the least. But looking out longer term, bigger picture, you can see that we have outperformed the benchmark over a 12 month period, three year period, five year period, and over a 10 year period. So uh, again, we're just navigating and finding value as we cycle through these uh, minor dips in the marketplace. And we can move to, what are we at right now? 29, uh, actually 31. Thank you. Now on a positive note, uh, from an accrual earnings basis, the total earnings for the portfolio over a 10 year period, we've been able to add a little bit over 8.5 million to the portfolio. So uh, there are definitely some positives even during a, a very challenging quarter. And we can move to slide 39. This is gonna be a little harder for me to read, but uh, the one thing I wanted to, I'm gonna pull this up on my end real quick, Leanne, but I think Good. that seems very pixelated. Oh, there we go, okay. Just give me one minute. If we move to page 39, oh, I'm sorry, are we on there? I, I'm on page 39, I believe. 39 okay. of 60. If you can page up just a bit. <clears throat> so you can see some of the yields that we're picking up. Uh, HSBC corporate notes, 3.75. That was purchased mid-May. Um, also the Picara Financial, we were able to pick up a 3.16 yield. And if you move to slide 42, we picked up a John Deere Capital Note at a 341 yield. And that's a, a A2 rating. So just to put things into perspective, we are picking up yields in the high 3%, slightly over 4% range. And that is going to start to uh, significantly reduce the unrealized losses that you're currently looking at on paper. But uh, if, if the Fed continues to aggressively raise rates, then market values will still be impacted. But, but again, uh, we'll, we'll, for the most part, we'll be looking at unrealized losses. And then slide 51, that would be the short term. Actually, 50, I'm sorry. So again, this is a snapshot for the short-term fund. And again, you can see the effective duration for the short-term portfolio, uh, roughly less than 30 days. Uh, yield at cost, yield at market, and the portfolio credit quality, A-rated. You can see you're 100% in commercial paper and everything else is pretty self-explanatory on that particular page. And 52, this is essentially just showing the activity, which uh, was 100% commercial paper. And again, on a, on a positive note, sorry, Leanne, you can go back to the- I'm back to 51. 52, I think, yeah. For some reason, the page numbers are getting cut off on the bottom, so. I'm on 51 um, right now. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, that's just reflective of the portfolio. It's 100% in commercial paper, so you can see uh, 
purchases in the blue portion. And then on the commercial paper side, it's just been sales and maturities as we uh, move through those. And we can just go to 52. And to again, end on a positive note, as far as earnings added to the portfolio over a 10 year period, you're looking at a little bit over 24.8 million. And those would be the prepared remarks I have. Steve, do you want to add anything additional? No, I think you covered uh, all the necessary information. And I'll open it up for questions. Well, this is a very small return, I get it, right? When you're talking about 1.5 million, 1.6 million for a year on 400, is it 450 million dollars? Well, if you look, if I, I'm going to I'm going to flip over to the district report, but when they're looking at the short-term portfolio, right. um, last year we weren't using PFM to buy securities. We were all all in to money markets and local government investment pools. Mm -hmm. This year. We did buy securities, um, but part of it is um, there's the 447. The 447 you're looking at here is that that's not is that all still in securities at this point? I thought as of June we had more in money markets. And I'll pull up. Let me pull up our, the district portfolio, the district report, because I can see it better there because um, it's all combined. It's not in the individual portfolios. Um, but this chart, this slide shows where the money is as of June 30th, and I think that might help. Let me make it a little bigger here, see if I can hide some things. Hide the tools. So we had a total of 1.6, almost 1.7 billion, um, and a lot of it is in overnight. Um, there's not a lot in cash, but we have quite a bit in money markets and local government investment pools. So the short-term portfolio, it, it is correct. It's 449. Um, it was significantly higher back in December when we first invested, when the tax revenues came in, we had almost, we had a lot of it in um, commercial paper and in some, some treasuries and agencies, but a lot of commercial paper. Um, we were capped back in December. We had the most we could put in commercial paper, and we ended up keeping quite a bit in pools and money markets. As things are, as securities are maturing, we look at whether or not to reinvest it in securities or to leave it in money markets and pools. And with the Fed taking such quick action right now and constantly raising rates, we found it advantageous to leave it in the pools and the money markets. They can react faster. So we, we've been reinvesting. We still have quite a bit in securities, but we've got a little bit more than, we've got more than that in money markets and pools. Yeah, that was my going to be my yeah, question. Well, that's right. I mean, as long, as long as you've got an inverted, inverted yield curve, you don't want to stay short. Right. There's no reason to uh, go out on the curve right. at all. And, right. Uh, I, you know, they're pursuing, obviously, you guys know what you're doing. You're pursuing the right strategy. It's just an unfortunate situation. And it's not likely to get any better. I mean, your right. own prognosis is various. Uh, in, in, inverted yield curves are, are d defined as an inevitable situation when you have a slow down in the economy. Right. So, right. you know, they're doing the right thing. And I guess in your case, I, although I prefer, frankly, commercial paper, mm -hmm. high quality, you know, really high quality commercial paper to, to these money market funds, um, I understand the, re the reason for it. So short, keep the duration short. And, right. uh, and uh, you know, may maybe we'll, one happy day, the, the inversion will uh, go away. Right. <laughs> um, well, what's the limit we have on commercial paper? It seems like on the short-term portfolio, you're almost all commercial paper, or you have been. We are. We are all commercial paper. Okay, all commercial paper. Isn't there no limit on the amount? There is, but it's the percentage based on the, the total portfolio. portfolio. They, so we look at how much we have in commercial paper. Every time we get ready to buy something, we're providing not right. only the investments, which PFM is very aware of what those are, but we're also sending them how much money we have in cash in the pools right. and the money markets so they can look at the entire portfolio to make sure we're in compliance. Okay, so my question then uh, to you all, and particularly Bill, is is there a risk in having all this money in commercial paper? No, not, not a, I, you know, I, 
you know, frankly, I would, I would just as soon lend, lend money to Toyota Motor Car Company than I would the United States government. <laughs> uh, probably the credit worthiness of Toyota is vastly okay. superior. All right. Well, you're a man of experience, obviously. I mean, just to use an example of some sort of off-the-run item. Okay. Yeah, and I, I want to point out at this point, I mentioned that we weren't going to have the meeting um, in September because we don't need to do the TAN sale. We don't usually have this much cash at this time of year. We, so we're starting to spend down. All of our money comes in December, and we spend it down steadily, and we get to October, November is when it's the lowest point. But we have plenty of cash right now, so there, we, we can't justify doing the borrowing at this time. We also have a lot in um, with the debt portfolio. This is at Bank of New York. That money is there for a very short period of time. We're required to make our debt service payments in June, and the payment's made on August 1st. So it's in very short, it's mostly in money markets and pools. Um, the Bark, the, what's listed here is Barclays. Um, it's a Ford delivery agreement. That is the principal that's accumulating for the Q-Skib that we did back in 2010. It's <clears> in a sinking fund. So that will, you'll see that number continue to grow up to the $67 million when we get ready to pay it off. So we're, we're, we're showing you the debt portfolio as well. So there's no reason for a TAN this year because you're flush. Yes. And what is the reason you're flush? Well, there's several reasons. One is the sales tax, and we'll, I'll show you the tail, sales tax slide in just a moment, but we also have a lot of federal money coming in that's offsetting operating expenses. So we're, we're in good shape cash-wise right now. Okay, but when the feds cut the, that, is that in risk? I mean, we prepared for that. We have to, we're working very closely. I'm gonna let um, Heather talk in just a minute about that, but we, the trick is to make sure that we're, we know there's going to be a funding cliff. This is short term, this is money that's coming in over a specific period of time, and we know it's going to run out, so we're being very <coughs> careful in how it's being used for non-recurring expenses. Um, we're continuing to do the math and the preparation to do the TAN every year, even if we're not doing it, because we need that historical data. So we're still running all those reports to check to make sure, do we need it, and when will we need it? I know we will be back in the TAN business at some point. We just don't need it this year. Do you want to add anything to that? Right. <clears throat> we're being very strategic in how we utilize the federal funds. Uh, we've only added um, about 370 positions within those federal funds. Our normal turnover um, with teaching staff each year is about 1,100, so we'll easily be able to absorb those once the ESSER funds run out. And then with the different recurring activities that we're funding through ESSER, we're slowly bringing those back into the general fund. And uh, you know we're, we're planning for the, the funding cliff, and, and at this point, we, we don't anticipate it to, to be an issue. Yes, we like having those additional funds, but to be honest, it also is difficult to spend them. So, so that's why they're in the portfolio to some degree. Right, because we've been able to, to offset some is existing expenses, but then when we're putting them in fund balance, we're saying those are one-time um, non-recurring funds that we're not then rebudgeting for recurring funds in future years. Question to Paul, are you saying this, seeing the same thing at the Solid Waste Authority? So you got a lot of excess cash? Okay. But it's not federal. It's from your, from your um, assessments, from the collections and assessments and value? Exactly. You're not getting any federal funds? No. We don't do it. Just the property value? Interesting. Actually, uh, oh. it's not necessarily property value. rates that we charge to the uh, residential folks, we generate that. Well, your special assessment presumably is also based on value, isn't it? Non-avalorum. Pardon me, non-avalorum special assessment, but doesn't that, it doesn't relate to the value of properties? Yes. But charge a rate. Right. Like, I think it's residential <coughs> mm -hmm. we have the, uh, I'm sorry I talk soft anyway you know we we provide the 
citizens with a rape every year. Right now, right. for 2023, it's going to be $184 <coughs> annually for each household. And so that's where we get our funding from primarily. <coughs> we have the fees that we charge when people bring garbage and yep. rates there. But we don't get federal funds. Yes, and then you're not really like a property tax, and you're not based on value of the property. You're simply based on a special assessment that, re that yes. funds your operating costs. Yes. And so that assessment is annually 184. Mm -hmm. It was higher this year, but next year we're projecting it'll be lower. Mm -hmm. Well, this thing about having surplus monies and causing problems is, in is interesting. <laughs> Well, it's, it's just that we have to be very careful or, or deliberate when we're explaining it to the unions that you know, the reason why we have an increase in the fund balance is due to these uh, one-time initiatives. For example, we're, we're pushing um, our textbook adoptions into the ESSER funds. And by doing that, we also receive money directly from the state for textbook adoptions. It's just not enough to cover the current costs of textbook adoptions. Mm -hmm. So we're able to utilize the ESSER funds to, to fund our uh, textbook adoptions for the next um, two years. We're building up that additional money that we're receiving <coughs> from the state for that purpose to cover the textbook adoption in 2027, which we would not have had enough money to fund. So it's again, you're going to see it's, it's building up additional cash to be used in a future year for a specific purpose. And it's restricted within our fund balance for that purpose. So that's just, just one example. We okay. have a um, very active discussion with the rating agencies as we're doing debt issues. And e even when we're not, they, they meet with us at least once a year to look at it. And our fund balance has, has really grown. And we're very clear with them. It's going to come back down. And that's what they're expecting to see. We had unusual circumstances going on with COVID. Um, this money's coming in. We have unusual expenses, additional resources that are being offered to students to get them back up to grade level, or any, any lost learning they may have had during the pandemic. So we're spending that money for very specific items. So they, they see some balance going up, and then we're going to see it come back down. So we're trying to set clear expectations for that. As a general proposition, this is just kind of a general question. Uh, as a general proposition, have there been any adverse uh, uh, impact from the great exodus out of the Northeast and, and uh, the uh, Illinois area uh, into Southeast Florida. I mean, it's all been positive. Uh, sales tax revenues have gone up and um, I can't imagine school, school population hasn't increased somewhat. But if there have been any, there, there's no negative associated with that as far as, as the school district is concerned, is there? I would say the, the only potential negative impact, um, and it, it's not necessarily from those specific indiv individuals moving down, is the growth of the family empowerment scholarship vouchers through the state. So yes, we are projected to have an increase in our enrollment district-wide, but that includes charter schools as well as family empowerment scholarships. So we're looking in, in FY23 of a growth of, of 3,600 students approximately, but for district operated schools, we're looking to really pretty much just maintain the student population we have. That growth is really within the voucher program. Um, so, and a, a lot of those, those students really never would have been public school students um, it, all, because all they, they would have always been in private school. So it's just expanding the, the population, the, in, uh, the population of enrollment that's now being funded through public dollars. So then is resulting in, in less dollars that we're receiving. Okay, I think what you're saying and I, is that you're shifting, there's so much per student and they can use it where they want. If they want to go to private school with that. Correct, right, the, the dollars follow the student. And so whatever the tuition happens to be, they'll fund up to approximately $7,500, $8,000 per student. So if the tuition is $6,000, the parent doesn't receive that difference. Uh, the, and, and it's funded directly to the school, to the private school. All right, so does that mean the private schools are growing? I, when the last, um, <clears throat> the, the last report I looked from the state 
the population of private schools really was not growing. So that's why it leads me to assume that those were students that never would have been in public schools because the number in the private schools didn't actually increase. But there have been articles recently that because of the influx, the private schools are now, they want to expand because there is more of a need because there's more parents that can afford um, to go to private school. So they are trying to, to expand the, the classroom space that they have available in order to, to meet that additional demand. And since it is such a new um, uh, initiative from the state, they really haven't been able to estimate what that growth is truly going to be. And uh, we projected, we have to submit our projected enrollment to the state, which includes family empowerment as well as charter schools in January, January prior to the start of the school year. And we disagreed uh, with the state on what we thought the growth of the projected uh, the, in the family empowerment scholarship vouchers was. We contested. We thought the increase was going to be over 4,000. They only gave us 900 of what we uh, requested. And my concern with that is that they're underestimating the enrollment growth statewide, which is then going to result in a holdback of funds because they didn't project enough money. So when they, when they fund us each year, they fund it based on a fixed amount of enrollment. If enrollment is less, we don't get any more money. Uh, but if projected enrollment is more, they say, oh, we're going to have to take money away from you because we only projected the amount of revenue for, the, for that set amount of students. In FY22, the state actually set aside a reserve because they weren't sure what that growth was going to be of about $455 million. This current year, the legislature did not include a reserve. And a part of the reason is that reserve went into the school recognition funds, which I don't know if you remember, there was that one, cons because of the max mass mandate, we were one of, I think, six districts that was not going to receive part of this $200 million. But the, one of the ways they were able to fund that $200 million school recognition was by taking that reserve away. Um, but now we are eligible for that school recognition money. We're just waiting to see, you know, what that School money recognition is. money for the value that you create for your grade, or what is that for? Correct, right. And so that was something that was eliminated for two years uh, when uh, the state adopted an, um, the teacher bonus program or teacher categorical program. And so now that was a way to help fund that increase in teacher pay. And so they did add back the... the, um, the teacher or the categorical um, this year, it's 200 million, which is more <clears throat> than what it's been in the past, but it primarily just goes to teacher bonus, not just teacher bonuses, but staff bonuses. So each SAC has the ability, uh, each school SAC has the ability to vote on how those funds will be spent. So overall, it's, it's had a direct negative impact, but a positive impact on sales tax and real estate taxes and Right. It's just, you know, the, the enrollment and how, how, you, how you look at that. And, yeah. and whether the individuals coming down from the north would be ones that would qualify from the income eligibility. Some would, some wouldn't. So. But all in all, it's been very positive in, ter in terms of sales tax and also the increase in the property values. You know, they've helped with that. I mean, this, we had an increase of 22.3 percent. That's the largest percentage increase since 2007. Yeah. And, and the SALT uh, provision, provisional is unlikely to be uh, repealed, at least it seems that, it, that it's not, not present right. in the right. proposed legislation. So the, the exodus will continue. Well, when you're talking about two th since 2007, isn't that the year of the recession? It is, but, but, it, but the reason for the, the fall in the property values um, or the recession was very different than the recession we're facing now. Yeah. And in, in terms of looking at the property values, we don't ex anticipate we're going to be seeing 20% increases in property values, but we do expect to at least hold where we're at mm -hmm. so you're with, with you know, single-digit increases in property values. And although as a school district, we're not fortunate enough to be able to see an increase of 22% in our revenue because it is limited uh, by uh, the state legislature, we are able to see that within our discretionary millage as well as our referendum. And our referendum is up for renewal in, in November of this year. And um, in 23 is approximately $275 million. It funds over 750 art, music, and PE choice academy teachers, um, teacher retention, recruitment and retention supplements, as well as mental health and, and security for the school. 
So it's very important you know, that, that you know, we get that message out to the voters and, and they, they support the district and continue to support the, the district because that, that represents over 10% of our general fund budget. That has been renewed year in and year out, hasn't it? Every four years Every it has to be years. renewed and, and it has been renewed by, by the voters. Right. We do also, like we have a finance committee, we have a, a committee for, the independent, for oversight of that referendum. Mr. Dumars is a representative on that committee and because we need to prove you know, that, or we want to be able to, to go back to the voters and have an independent oversight committee that we demonstrate to show we're spending the money how we said we were gonna spend the money. And How's we, it going, Paul? Going good. All right, I have a, a big question for PFM um, and you all, and that is, and, and Bill, and Bill, and Paul, um, in this, all this excess money that the schools are getting from the feds, from account of the prior legislation, is that driving the um, inflation and possible toward recession? All this excess cash that you've had, well, we're not unable we're to spend. Well, we're not using any of our ESSER dollars for anything capital related. Mm -hmm. So everything we're spending our our federal funds on um, is all related to staffing, um, tutoring initiatives. Uh, it's we made a decision to not use it for capital purposes since we already you know, had such a detailed 10-year capital plan. We already had the sales tax. Uh, we already, we didn't have a need, you know, based on the, the expert advice that we have from Ms. Evans here, we already had a plan on, on the capital side. Uh, so I, we are seeing increase, we did see increases, but it was because of the demand nationwide on wipes and, you know, <laughs> You wouldn't believe the amount of money that we spent on, on hand wipes for the and schools. Hand sanitizers. Hand sanitizers and soap. That's what you meant by wipes, but now paper, I get it. And paper towels. And, you know, it's, it's when you think of the, the size of our district, it puts it into perspective. But, um, yes, but we've been seeing just overall increases in just all of our services, from right. food um, to our fuel for our buses. And you know, then trying to give that money you know, back to the employees, it's just difficult because our funding is set by the state legislature. So we were very fortunate um, this year in FY23, the legislature increased our base student allocation by $230. And they, with the caveat that we had to increase our minimum wage to $15 per hour. So we, since we were still bargaining when the legislative session um, ended, we made that increase to $15 an hour uh, retroactive to January 1st of this year. We were paying our custodians uh, $11.09 an hour. And so now that will help to at least make us a little bit more competitive. Um, and then they also set aside in FY23 um, $16 million for additional teacher salary compensation. But that money has to also be shared with charter schools as well as family empowerment scholarships. So that's not all for us. I, I think Ms. McQuinn had her hand raised a few minutes ago. I don't know if you still- I did, just very, very quickly. I didn't know that Heather was on at the beginning. So I, this is just kind of, uh, because I'm referring to the um, tentative budget that we adopted. But Mike Burke, our former CFO, who's now our superintendent, I think all of you know, Mike always brought Heather to the table to deliver the bad money news. <laughs> and I will tell you, it's really the truth. And I will tell you, and she used to talk like really fast to do it. And so when she was came to us Wednesday night, she actually, by herself at the table, she actually started out with a smile. And she says, I'm cautiously optimistic. It was wonderful. So. I, Heather has just been incredible and her, her part of negotiations with our unions, um, I'll tell you what, we statewide, we look really good competitively. And again, that referendum, I will tell you, we're, I, I don't know if Heather told you, but we retained our A school district rating. And right, and that helps us attract those quality teachers which impacts obviously all of our community. So again, I'll tell you what, we have the best money people in the, I think in the nation serving our kids. Okay, I'll be Bravo. quiet now. <laughs>
we, I think we agree, don't we? Yes, indeed. Absolutely. I think we ought to demand a 50% raise. <laughs> <laughs> well, say. we get uh, if we get it for them. If we get it for lives. ourselves, that's fifty percent of I nothing. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to. A lot of this is um, information that PFM has already reviewed. This is just the total portfolio. Um, this is the chart that gives everybody a headache. But this is how I'm monitoring and managing how we're investing. Um, we've got this label as projections, but it's really, this is actuals, and this is what we, we've done through June. Actually, I think this goes out to today. Um, we're going to be start working on the projections for, you see this spiked up, we just did a, um, the retroactive payment for the raises just went out today. You see a lot of people smiling around the district today, they got big checks. Um, we'll be updating this for new property tax revenues coming in, so when we meet in October, I'll have projections, and we'll be looking at where you swear it was. Um, these are the holdings, and I'm skipping ahead to the sales tax. I want to make sure I touched on this. Um, it's an it's an awkward time of the year for me because I'll tell you, here's the revenue we received through July, the expenses and everything. I've got an estimated expense through June. We still had not booked all the accrual entries for June, so these numbers will be revised. Um, and the interest earnings were through May, so it's it's kind of a Mix, uh, mixed bag of information here, but the sales tax revenues um, continue to come in higher than projected. We're overall at 119% of projections. Um, I'm still looking at it and expecting that the sales tax will end a year early. I think it's going to end in um, calendar year 25, but we have a recession. It looks like we're gonna have a recession coming. It could slow down. We could end up running the extra year. Um, Lots of things can change between now and then. So we're, we monitor and we update this information monthly um, to see where we're at. But the sales tax program's all running well. Um, if you look at it, we've got, we've received 806 million. We've spent 514 million. So when you talk about cash, there's quite a bit of sales tax revenue as well. Uh, when we talk about money, part of it is sales tax, part of it's federal funds. Um, there's, there's, we have a lot of cash. We're encouraging our facilities department is going as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. They run into supply chain issues. Right now it's a six month, is it six month lead time I think for air conditioning parts? Um, it takes time to get things. So as we're doing these renovations and repairs, it's hard to get the materials. So it, it slows things down, the costs are going up. And we've talked a lot about that with the sales tax oversight committee and, and how we're going to manage that. Um, we do have a plan to be able to complete everything on that referendum list. Okay, I'm going to stop there and make sure, do, are there any questions on investments? Okay, I wanna skip over and I'm going to go through this fast. Um, this is the, this is a board, this is part of a board workshop that we did in June. I was hoping to bring you the full capital plan and we're almost done with it. It's going to the board on August 17th. Um, we're still doing some reviews. It's not ready for me to show to you, but I'll send that out to you as soon as it's ready. Um, but what I wanted to do was at least give you a snapshot of the FY23 capital budget, because it's really important from my perspective. I need to show you that we've set aside the money to make debt service payments, because that's, that's something this committee is directly overseeing, it's just the issuance of debt. So capital budget was balanced. We still have some things to close out, um, so there'll be some slight changes. These are the biggest changes um, for the upcoming capital plan things that we've done. The hard panic solution, we were funding it from capital. It's actually being funded from the referendum. Um, that's the hard, you may have seen that on the news. All staff are going to have a special card that has a button on it that we can press in case there's an emergency to call 911. Um, just trying to make sure we've got all the security in place for our schools and hopefully we never need to use those. Um, we're also um, up putting in a modernization of North Tech, River Beach Prep. Um, it's now a modernization of South Intensive at the Old South Tech, modernization of West Transportation. These are new things that were added into the capital plan. Um, we're upgrading all the media centers and high schools. Um, we've accelerated everything related to the building envelope maintenance program, and that comes into, that's painting, it's waterproofing, it's sealing walls and windows and doors. We're moving all those up into FY23, adding in um, digital marquees for all the high schools so that it's more easy for them to update their message to parents and students. Um, and we're now calling it guard houses instead of guard shacks, but it's, um, we're putting a, a, 
a small building at the gate for every high school so they can monitor who's coming in and out of the campuses. Um, and this is just our facilities department went through in more detail the changes to each of the facilities that was approved. We talked a little bit about the transferable development rights. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this to the committee last time, but at Dreyfus School of the Arts, it's downtown. There's a lot of building going on. If you've been downtown any time recently in the last year, there's cranes everywhere. Um, there's lots of people want to build tall buildings and they are capped. So we can basically sell our air rights um, where we will not be building on top of that school. We can sell those to the city and those dollars then will be used. We're expecting it to be, I think it's about $8 million was the last I heard. Um, about 50% is gonna be set aside for Dreyfus and 50% for other historic properties in the county. So we'll be using it specifically for that. How does that work? Can you give us an example of where that would be? Where you'd have the sale of development rights above your building? Blair probably can answer that question better than I can. So as far as geographic areas that the board owns property, Dreyfus is the only property that we have that's eligible to sell the TDRs. Is that, was that what your well, question was? Well, I guess was? so, but how would you, how is that utilized? Oh, so in this case, we're gonna sell them, or we are proposing to sell them to the city of West Palm Beach, who will then resell them to developers in areas that are designated to receive the TDRs for projects that they're gonna build and they will be able to build more density than they otherwise more would More density be. or higher? Uh, well, I guess both. both. I mean, yeah. Okay, and that's because the buildings are low at, uh, in that big area that Dreyfus has? Is, is that how it's calculated? It's, it's calculated on the on the open area within an air, uh, within a basically a rectangle of the eastern part of the campus that can that contains those Fields. historic buildings. Okay. So we did a survey of that whole area, and you subtracted out the area that was already has the buildings on it, and so all the open space. The difference between those two numbers is the square footage that we had TDRs for which we could sell. I and, see. The, and the number actually went up slightly. It's, I think it was, a, it's up to about $8.3 million, give or take, because the, the amount of open area once that survey was completed was a little bit larger than we had originally estimated. Okay, I guess, do you all understand that? Well, I, 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 that's co quite common in New York City, I know, yeah. that yeah. To, uh, to do that sort of thing. So basically, others can have denser properties because there exists right now space at the School of the Arts or at places like that. Right, and, the, and, and, and they have to pay for it. The, they have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're proposing to sell these at uh, $17 per square foot. Um, and th and then the city the city is expecting to at least recoup what they've paid us. We actually have a provision in there that if the city sells them for more than the seventeen dollars a square foot, that we get fifty percent of any of that excess as well. Good, mm. excellent, interesting. TDRs, like you did a good job in negotiating that. <laughs> Now, I, I'll, I'll take a little bit of credit for the, well, the, if, the if they sell it for more, thinking about that and saying, hey, we ought to, you know, they, they ought to benefit, but so should we. Right. Yeah. Yep. Good to you. So those are not actually in the capital budget yet. We expect to add them um, once they're approved. So once they're approved, we'll be adding that in. Um, then we have, this is a list that the, the, it's important for the board to see the projects that are in the capital, in the, um, capital plan. And these are the ones, um, the current budget for FY23 is $446 million for construction. Um, there's notes for the new projects that we just went over. So otherwise, let me see if I can make it a little bigger. Anything that's in italics is on the referendum list. So there are a few things that are not on the referendum list. Um, only the transportation buildings are actually funded with sales tax. Everything else is funded with COPS or local property taxes for the rest of these. 
um, debt service. Um, this is the one slide I wanted to make sure that you got to see. And I'm updating this. I have an updated version of it that's based on the updated property values, the taxable values. So this chart, the, the red and green lines change. You see a big spike up in 23, and then it stays at the same um, same slight rise over time. We did have that 22% increase in property value. So it adjusts this chart a little bit. And when we bring it to the board August 17th, they'll see the revised slide, and I'll certainly share that with you yeah, afterwards. The blue is going to go all the way up to the green, the blue. The, the, no, it's the red. The red and the green lines both will shift up. The amount of debt, um, the, the gray bars or the tan bars, is the debt service for um, debt that we've already issued. Principal and interest payments for debt that's already been issued. Blue is the proposed debt issues in the capital plan. So over the next 10 years, this is the principal and interest payments that we expect to make. <clears throat> um, that the red line shoots up, so we have it gives us more capacity to borrow in the future. Uh, then we also have a lot of other facility projects. There's 642 million in the budget. A lot of that is sales tax. That's the large facility renewal projects that are going on, as well as ongoing maintenance for air conditionings, roofs, doors, windows, plumbing, everything. Um, that's all in the capital budget. And we have some money set aside for some site acquisition. And for security, the budget, um, it's actually a little higher than this now, but about $36 million um, for security projects. Well, this is within the capital budget. Um, $46 million for school buses and various vehicles and equipment um, associated with transportation. And then straight up equipment, um, there's $13 million. The new change there, we've added in money to update all the equipment at the school TV studios. And I've, I manage the capital budget in, in, in addition to doing investment and debt. And I'm constantly looking for what are we not putting money out there for. And when we build the schools, we put in beautiful TV studios, and then they haven't been updated since the schools were built. So they showed me some pictures of the big giant monitors that, that take up the entire desk. So we, we're getting those all replaced, and we'll be updating those this year. And then technology. This budget has risen significantly over the past couple of years. The minute we went to a one-to-one -one ratio to where every student has a computer, um, we're buying a lot more computers, and we're replacing a lot more computers as they as they age out, and a lot more repairs. So the the budget for technology has increased significantly. We've also increased the budget for cyber and network security, um, just to make sure that we keep our envelope safe, not only for physical security but also for technology. Other capital items: property and flood insurance, a little over twelve million. Our reserves. Um, were higher, and um, that, that's a lot of that is a sales tax reserve that's set aside to deal with cost escalation that we expect to see on the construction projects. And then charter schools, um, there's always a caveat. We have to provide money to charter schools. The state did fund that again this year. Um, so the state is giving us the money, and we're passing it through to the charter schools. And that's really it for the capital budget. Um, I have in here that it's under review, and it is under final review. Um, I have a draft, and we're just making sure that we've got everything in that needs to be in there, and it will be going to the board on August 17th. Um, some of the legislative things, this, slot, this part of this presentation has stayed consistent over several years. We're always monitoring for legislative changes, um, for things related to how we fund things, requirements for charter schools, the cost per student station calculation that becomes really critical for construction projects. Um, one of the concerns that we're all looking at is additional needs for maintenance. It is hard to get staff. Just like everywhere else in the news, there are labor shortages. It's hard to find people. That's a significant issue. If we can't have, if we don't have enough staff to do the work, we have to outsource it, and those costs are rising every day and rising construction costs. So we're monitoring all of those. So that's just an overview of the capital budget. The capital plan, as I said, it'll be done, and I'm hoping to be finished today. Um, and it goes out to the board um, next week. So we'll be reviewing that on August 17th. So once that's public, I'll be happy to send it to you. And I can go through that presentation when we meet next. Okay, you have an oversight committee that deals with that capital plan, mm -hmm. or is that the, the one we that's We have just an the oversight school? committee for construction. For construction. Construction yeah. Oversight and Review Committee that looks at everything related to construction. Right. Um, their, their agenda items, they usually get a package of, of over a thousand pages for every meeting and they meet monthly. 
So if anybody's interested in really digging into the weeds on construction, let me know because sometimes they have openings. Um, they do a lot, they, they read literally thousands of pages each month reviewing all the contracts and specs. Oh, but ultimately, we, we're not responsible for no. approving the capital plan. No, you're, the only reason I bring it to you every year is so that you can see the slide on debt service. And I also give you this whenever we're borrowing money, you get to see an update on that. Mm -hmm. But the capital budget pays for the principal and interest payments. So that's the one slide that's important to you. The rest of it's just <clears throat> informational. I, well, I know it's interesting. I know you all like to see, see where that. it's going. But your only concern, really concern, your, your responsibility is to make sure that we're overseeing investments in debt, and that's a key piece of it. Okay, Ms. McQuinn has a question. Just very quickly, um, we have all those school buses purchased, which is great, but we are very short school bus drivers. So, Steve, should you be looking for um, some kind of change <laughs> in employment when you retire? We'll train you, we'll pay you. <laughs> And, that, and they're getting, what is it now? Um, um, I can't remember whether it's Heather or Leanne, but they're, we've raised their pay to $17.39 yeah. an hour. And we have so, great benefits, great health benefits. Yes, so just letting you know, thank you. We'll get the word out. <laughs> Leanne. <Wow>. Yes. <laughs> Mass shooting, I know every time it happens, the school districts must you know, feel the tightness of all of it. And um, recently, we went through it. Uh, Fort Lauderdale is dealing with it in court now. Um, are we putting any more money this year in because of that? Or We have increased the budget for security for this year. Um, and they had quite a bit of money already. Um, we've, the sales tax and the operating referendum both provided money for security. So, um, and then there are state grants that come through for security as well. So we are putting all the dollars that really are asked for. You know, when, it, when, an, when an idea comes up of something that can make our schools more secure, we're moving forward with that. So the newest one is the, it's called Centegics, and there's a, all staff will have a badge with a button that you press that calls in the Calvary. And that button goes, it goes to 911. So it hits school police, it hits the local jurisdiction. Um, the system can tell where the person is in the building um, to get help to them as quickly as possible. So that, that's the newest thing. It's been implemented this summer and is in play, will be in place for every school before they open next week. I don't know if you want to talk about some of the other ones. I know. Has that been used other places, or is this, are we on it's the It's been customer? implemented. I believe Martin, I know Martin County has it. I believe Hillsborough Schools implemented it last year. Um, I'm not sure all the other districts. It's, it's being used in the state of Florida, but it's pretty cutting edge. Yeah, sounds like it. Sounds like it also have a lot of false alarms, unfortunately. Well, you do have to press it a certain way and multiple, yeah. times, multiple times in order to try to minimize the, the false alarms. Uh, it has but, to be pressed at least eight times, but they can do it quickly. Yeah. So it's not something you would accidentally do. And, and we, and like Ms. Evans said, security has been a priority for our district ever since Sandy Hook. And it just, we just keep reinforcing and improving our security protocols and our investments within security. And the referendum has allowed us to, to go above and beyond what the state requirements are. Does that button in some way um, initiate a lockdown of the school? Oh, yes. You know what I mean? Doors close, whatever. I want to be very careful that I don't talk about anything that came out of our closed session Mm -hmm. um, when board members got an update, but the answer is that would be public information. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and there are locked boxes then for, for municipalities outside of school police to access the school. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, and they trained um, our police chief, Sarah Mooney, has, um, of course, she was um, assistant chief in West Palm Beach. So she has great relationships with all of our municipalities. So they know they're literally doing training probably as we speak on accessing those lock boxes so they can get into schools. Mm -hmm. And um, 
uh, in addition to sound alarms, which we always had, there's now flashing lights. So if you have anybody on the playground, they can see all that. And we are working with the fire departments about automatic locking of inside doors. So I, I'll tell you, I'll, it doesn't mean something can't happen anytime, anywhere, but we are so well trained and our school police and municipalities this summer trained with the FBI. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I feel as good as you can possibly feel. Yeah, that's a super report, Barbara, thank you. Really. Okay, so I think that concludes all the presentations for today. Um, I'll go back to the agenda. So we've covered all the items on there. At the last meeting, um, the committee voted to ask the board to give you all the ability to possibly elect Mr. Miller as chair again to waive the term limits. So that's on the agenda for August 17th. So you're, the election of chair and vice chair is always the first meeting after school starts. So school starts next week. So um, we'll have that lined up for you all in October when you can elect, and then anyone can be elected as chair or vice chair. Um, so that'll be on the agenda next time. And that next meeting would be, we're gonna skip the September meeting since we don't have the TAN sale. So the next meeting would be October 28th. No book. Same time, same place. Okay. All right, any further? No, I'd just to... like to thank you all for coming and for those, and I forgot to mention Mr. Warner did join us during the meeting, so he is here. Um, he's been here throughout the meeting as well. Hello, Jack. We can't, are you there in person? We can't see you, or can we? Jack has disappeared. He may have turned his camera off. Yeah. Well, regards, right. Jack, in one way or the other. Yeah, he, was, he was here. Mr. and Mr. Conner were here, were here virtually, so... Um, only Mr. Elmore was not able to attend. He had a conflict, but everyone else was here today. So right, thank you all. We appreciate it. Thank you. For everyone that's online, again, if you'd like to be included in the minutes as attending the meeting um, and you joined by phone, please let me know because I can't, I don't know the phone numbers, but everyone that's on the meeting through the internet, I'll know that you've attended. So I see Mr. Koner's face just popped up. Um, thank you for yep. joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, Leanne. That was terrific. And thank you, Heather, right. also. And Heather, thank you. PFM, we had a terrific, I think yes, it was a terrific indeed. meeting. Any? Oh, I have Steve to kick around anymore. That's the bad news. <laughs> Two more meetings with Steve. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, congratulations to you, Steve. Congrats. We'll miss, we'll right. miss working with you. We look forward to you. seeing you, Steve, in December. Yes, I look forward to seeing you all in December. Thank you, everybody. Okay, super. Well, with that, if there's no more business, the meeting. So, so moved. Second. Second. Okay. Second. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you. Bye, everybody.